Welcome to the Eskrima podcast. My name is Jason Enai, and I'm an Enai and Eskrimador. So uh, it's Wednesday. Uh, so we're, what, three days away, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Right? We're three days away from the 23rd annual Mungusasura Memorial Seminar or Workout. I've been holding these uh, events every year, except for during COVID. Of course, there was all, a little bit of get together here and there with some some people during that time. But for the most part, uh, it's been every year. And I've had guest directors, like I had mentioned before, um, uh, Grandmaster Harone. I'd had um, uh, Grandmaster Ev Pepper, who was a student of my father's. I've had, you know, uh, some of my instructors or my dad's actually students come to teach as well. Like uh, Tony Samus Vatov was there one year. Uh, he's a master guru, teaches out in Kansas, still trains under me. Great guy. Uh, and then, uh, but this year, this year, we're going to have uh, Mushtaq Ali Al Ansari. He's going to teach in Chamandi. And we're going to have. The Stockton multi style folks to teach their SLD, Serata Larga de Cordes. That's pretty exciting. And, and, and Grandmaster uh, Miguel Ruby teaching uh, Dosi Paris Espadi Daga. And, uh, but last night <clears throat> we had our Tuesday night class and uh, we worked a little bit on Sinawali and I in Sinawali, which will be part of the subject for the memorial. Uh, but uh, we worked on that for a little bit, and then we worked on uh, and I Kudina de Mono, and we worked on more of a structuring thing, you know. So results are always important in our training. Like, what are we achieving with any particular result? <clears throat> you know, if we're if we're memorizing a drill for the sake of the drill itself, or learning more drills for the sake of more drills, then then what we're doing with our system and our training is is drilling. Uh, for the for the sake of drilling, like you've got this drill and that drill, and you know beginner drills and advanced drills and expert drills or black belt drills or whatever. <coughs> but in the Anayan system of Eskrima, it's more about what we can learn from those drills, from the techniques that we do, that bring us closer to being more capable as fighters, right? So that's what we're really looking for. And what's going to make us more capable as fighters? So, you know, in the Anayan system of Eskrima, as I hope it is with any any martial art that's concerned with self-defense, concerned with uh, combat effectiveness, whether that be street fighting or, or uh, in preparation for somebody who's going to maybe be in law enforcement or in the military or something of that nature. The focus is not on, you know, let's learn all this curriculum, but let's let's use this con curriculum to enable one to be able to, to fight um, when they need to. So we're doing Kadena Mono and the structuring is, is done now uh, where, you know, we learn their hand drills at a more rapid rate, not for the purpose of necessarily becoming good at, good at them, although that would be the case, but to enable us to move to uh, integration of our other skills inside the drills. So timing, uh, bringing in uh, joint locking and breaking, and uh, the deployment of tools, the defense against various attacks, right? To be able to do this, at first in a reflexive way and then in a responsive way. So we covered that last night. And that was a lot of fun because we got a little bit deeper in, spent more time on those drills and kind of exploring them uh, for that purpose and then allowing for a sense of uh, exploration on the part of the students with a little bit of guidance, right? So that being the um, fourth path of learning within the cipher. So uh, it was fun, I, ha I had a good time uh, demonstrating that material and uh, giving the students an opportunity to work with it. And I got to demonstrate with um, a number of the students together. So that was awesome too. So I think the thing that I, I find most valuable about 
keeping the curriculum focused around, you know, the value of empirical knowledge and, you know, towards, you know, will this work if, uh, if someone's trying to hurt you is that it keeps the art itself honest within each practitioner and it spurs uh, growth and exploration and, uh, and hopefully, you know, each of the students gain a sense of discovery uh, through that process. It's funny because, like, the way that I uh, learned Kudina de Mono uh, when I was very young, so, because I had started when I was six, and the way that we trained in 79 and 80 and 81 and 82 uh, was different, you know. Uh, see, I, I probably trained consistently all the way up until, see, about, yeah, about 89, 90. 89, 90 is more consistent than there was a year where <clears throat> I didn't get along with my father, and so I, I trained elsewhere. Uh, I mostly did solo training that time. But um, it was funny there because I came back and we have this thing called a Guru's Review, and uh yeah, I, I performed perfectly for the Guru's Review. So that was that was pretty cool. A year off, technically speaking, come back. But um, the way that I learned, you know, from from like 79 to like maybe 80 to 80, not, not later than 84, 85, but not so many hand drills. Uh, you know, we, we had a bunch, uh, but not even a half of what we have now. And we learned, so I, and I was explaining at the end of the class last night, we did uh, joint locking and reversals. And we do that under the structure of what we call lock flows. So the different kinds of lock flows, there's like the passive lock flows that we typically see where the practitioner moves from one lock to another in a logical sequence that implies resistance from the opponent, right? So you, you go for a wrist lock and they resist it, so that gives you the straight arm lock and then they bend the arm and resistance that which gives you some kind of bent arm lock which is like you go from wrist to elbow to shoulder right uh, and then there's uh, like a, a reactive lock flow which is what we do and that's where you know I apply a lock on you you reverse that lock or you escape and reverse that lock into your own lock and it goes back and forth back and forth right there's also what's called a preemptive lock flow and that is where you go to do the lock, they react and you preempt the reversal into another lock, right? So uh, this is all, you know, things that my father would say. It says, well, you know, you're past the lock flow and you do it this way and we practice the reactive lock flow and you could do a preemptive lock flow and I teach what's called a degenerative lock flow, which is not important right now, right? So uh, the, the process of this creates a vocabulary for people to be able to lock and reverse. Now, when I was a student, you know, as I'm kind of alluding to, is, is it was different. We had what was called reverse and reverse. And uh, I, we still make the students now do that after they've gone through the lock flows, which is a much more contrived way of, of teaching locks and reversals. However, the reason why my father designed that was is because uh, all of us in that we're learning from the reverse and reverse method exclusively, uh, which is without any kind of patterning whatsoever, is that we begin to favor certain locks, right? Favor certain movements and reversals. And so then it became this almost repetitive sequence of locks and reversals due to a bias by each individual. So the flow would be different between each individuals if there was enough permutation but generally speaking, whenever you work with, you know, say I, I'm working with uh, Bob, Bob and I usually always have the same sequencing flow because of our preferences. It's very, very typical. Not exactly a pattern, but also very predictable. The problem with patterning is it creates predictability if that's all you live on and you, you, you crutch on, right? But if you, you know, as my uncle Danny would say, is you know their pattern, learn the pattern, teach the pattern, practice the pattern, dissolve the pattern. It's that dissolve the pattern part that's that's difficult for people. So we so we use the lock flows now <clears throat> to develop vocabulary so that when you go back to reverse and reverse, 
since you have much more choices in uh, your toolbox, if you will, the idea of following the law of requisite variety is easier because you have more choices, you're aware of those choices and you execute with those choices, right? So in the same sense, right, we want to develop that within the, hand, the, the empty hand fighting. And the way that I learned was, you know, what we call fundamental and skill drills now, as opposed to what some people would call hooba drills, right? Whether it's these sequence techniques, whether it's empty hand or knife that involves a lot of trapping and reversing and clearing and counterattacking and the utilization of the hand and the elbow, the fist and the knife uh, and other tools, right? Again, uh, you know, the way that my, my dad's teacher, Greek Grand Master Max Armenta taught was anecdotally. So more along the lines of techniques, which uh, falls under what we would call classical conditioning. And then what happened was, people became enamored with the circular drills, these closed loop exercises, which is more about motor skill development than it is any kind of conditioning in terms of behavioral shaping. So it was different, it was different. You know, when he does this, you do like that. You know, the guy punches and then he shows you two or three techniques. And then when you get tired and you can't practice anymore, well then we would do some basic hand drills and the foundation one drill, the peri peri check, the double brush block or whatever you want to call it, standard huba drill, right? Uh, one for one, I think is what my uncle Danny calls it. Although it's not a one for one, it's a, a straight punch. But anyways, there's <clears throat> very similar drills either way. Uh, we need to step away from that uh, thing. You know, it's funny in tech right now, uh, a lot of these websites, these big companies, they have these large, what they call monolith applications. And uh, they're, they're large behemoth-like code bases that do a bunch of stuff. And the process is to decompose right now, the tech thing to do right now is, is to decompose that monolith application into its little, little jobs, microservices, right? And then they're all singular microservices that work with each other and they build APIs that make it so that the microservices can talk to each other and they work together in, in a way as to allow for more complex functionality. And then while they're doing that, they have to stabilize that, uh, that monolith until it's fully decomposed, right? And in the same way, you know, you're, the, the, the training that we teach that we, we have, and this is common of, of most systems that I've, I've been exposed to, is the, the curricula itself is, is this monolithic structure that we try to maintain with the hopes that it, it develops variety and uh, um, versatility in the student to be able to accommodate various opponents, various kinds of attacks, and also enable various kinds of strategies. But the process of building out reflexes and uh, responsiveness, which is ideal. Responsiveness means choice. Reaction is like, oh, I don't know. I, I just reacted. That's a, not a choice, right? Uh, is that we got to decompose that monolith structure uh, into its little pieces so that the students can practice them and then reassemble them together in their own ways to express themselves as an opponent strikes and attacks and, and defends the, the, the other person's attack. And it's an interesting kind of microcosm, macrocosm kind of uh, thing. The more you know of different things, the more everything is kind of the same. You know, going back to the Canadian Amato and last night, you know, we're working on a number of the drills, how they incorporate different stances or different footwork in each of the drills to expose like an imp you know they're supposed to say something about like what you're doing if you're learning right like you should be able to fight when you're stepping like this and you should be able to fight when you don't step and you just stand like this or that and then so on and so forth that process is important in the development of, of a, each individual you know uh, a, a 75 pound uh, young girl is not going to 
be able to employ the techniques the same way as a 250 pound man, right? And so uh, we have to understand that a, a certain kind of physicality is needed for certain kinds of defenses. And as, as an instructor, it behooves me to understand the differences enough to be able to guide a student from one drill to another as a way of, you know, developing defensive capability, or <clears throat> maybe from one expression to another with the same drill or technique. So I might do a block the hard way, uh, and then I might show a softer version of that technique that requires more nuance, but allows someone of lesser stature to overcome and prevail against someone of greater stature. And all of this has to be able to be presented within the structure of the entire curriculum, this big monolith, right? And these drills. And then it needs to be done in such a way that we don't become so inured with the drills that that's what we're doing as we're drilling, right? We got to go back to that first thing that I opened it. The idea about it is, is like, you know, if you're just doing drills for drills, then your art is about drilling and not about fighting, right? So you need drills. I remember uh, um, at the seminar, uh, one of the, the big seminars here in San Jose, I think it was the Goshenu. That was a really cool back in the day thing that Zanchin Enterprises and Professor Hans Ingebrigtsen used to do at San Jose State. And it'd be like, I don't know, 30, 40 instructors, 500 participants. It was a very big symposium. And everyone had about an hour. I remember I taught uh, in 96 and 97, I think. And, um, you know, there were so many people teaching at the same time, but there were so many participants. I had 50 people in my session, right? And, uh, but I remember uh, watching this one guy, and he's talking about drilling, and he's like, and he's, he's, he's a, a popular, uh, popular uh, presenter, if you will, of Filipino martial arts. Uh, and this guy, <clears throat> in like a southern drawl, tall, tall guy, white guy, you know, has a good command presence. He's like, drills, drills, drills. Everybody's drilling. All you're doing is learn this drill and that drill and that's not what fighting is. Totally agree with that sentiment. And then he proceeded to teach a drill. <laughs> so I, I agree with the sentiment that we don't want to learn drills, but at the same time, right? If we use drills and we use techniques and exercises, closed loop and open loop drills, and we use scenario training and, tech, and contextual training and things like that as a part of an overall continuum that starts with maybe skill development and skill integration and then moves on to you know motor development and then classical and operant conditioning and so on and so forth, that as part of a continuum, it, it's necessary. As long as we know the patterns teach the patterns, train the patterns, practice the patterns, and then we just let go of those patterns, right? And that's where, you know, like I, at the, um, the gathering for the Martial Arts Collective Society that I taught in Sacramento last weekend, you know, we talk about, at least I, I talk about the idea that, you know, you're, you're never gonna be a student of every one of the instructors there, but what you can do is you can open up your horizons with the different perspectives of all of these instructors, right? And that as long as you take what you like and dislike from every one of these instructors and add it to, as part of a continuum, meaning a, you know, a structured line from beginning to end, if you will, or even a cycle that you repeat, right? To continue to expand your knowledge, your awareness of things, and then increase your capability it's fine uh, you know, years ago I got to meet Grandmaster Tom Sippen uh, in Milwaukee an amazing person great human being <clears throat> and uh, we were doing uh, these all Filipino weekends seminars in Wisconsin and so myself uh, the, the whole goal was to to you know continue to present Filipino martial arts uh, specifically uh, under people who were t who are actually ethnically Filipino the idea there is 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 that you know whilst 
everyone should be able to practice and teach and, and do it. And it's great. And that's the purpose of the movement that started in the 60s and 70s by these great men that we now, whose accomplishments we now leverage, right? You know, Inch Kabbalas, right? You have Remy Prasis, Kakoi Kinetti, Junisio Kinetti, right? Um, Michael Dan Usano, uh, Sam Tendencina, uh, Flora Villabrell, Dizone, Floris, Flor, uh, um, Felicissimo Dizone, right? Just, just these amazing people, right? And we, we, we leverage from them their efforts and their sacrifices to continue to do that. And everybody should be allowed to do that. It is the ethnic heritage of the Filipino. And so we were just doing this all Filipino all martial arts by all Filipino instructors kind of thing. So, and it was uh, Grandmaster Tom Sippen. Uh, Grandmaster Tom Lopez, uh, Mahaguru Nate Defensor, got Puno Abundio Bayet. That guy is amazing. That guy's awesome. Anyway, so, so we're all teaching. <clears throat> and I realize that Tom Sippen is the person that wrote, or at least one of the people that wrote the original rule set for a world disagreement called the Ernest Federation. An amazing organization of 65 member countries that did these world championships every year in uh, Cebu, Philippines. They wear these, uh, if you're not familiar, they wear helmets and they wear these, these jackets and then they wear projective gear under these jackets. From, so they're basically armored from, from tip of finger to uh, at least the shins of their legs, their head, everything is armored for protection. It's great. And, you know, it becomes this thrashing mess where they're just banging on each other. No one's really blocking. It's like, you know, and, I, and, and I've always disparaged it. I had always disparaged it. And so now I'm confronted with the situation where here's this person that did it, who created it, and if I don't say anything, then I'm just like complaining in the, on the wings and and not, you know, being a forthright human being. So I, I approach him and I say, you know, I, I got to tell you, I hate the weak half rule set. I hate the way no one blocks. I hate the way that it makes our art, our beloved art, look like a wild thrashing mess. And I didn't say it that way, but that's the way I'm, that's what I was trying to express in the only way I can think of it right now, right? And um, he goes, yeah, you know, you're right. I went, what? <laughs> he goes, well, the actual rules are that if you don't block, the center judges are supposed to disqualify you. And then he introduces a new thing that they're doing, which is this engagement rules for padded sticks, low armor, um, which uh, is a little bit truer to the way a fight might be. <clears throat> And so we've collaborated over the years, uh, we, pre-COVID, and since then, we, you know, I haven't connected with the organization that he's in now, which is Global Stick and Blade Alliance. Uh, I brought some fighters, actually, my daughter included, to their world championships in Rome in like 2014 or something like that. But a good organization. And of course, Grandmaster Tom's a, a, a great guy. But what I realized, <clears throat> because Grandmaster Nilo and Polito in Hollister California one year got me to center judge a week half match and while I still don't like the tendency for people to just wail on each other because you can't do that if you're not wearing any padded gear whatsoever I mean not even a helmet that kind of thing is not a thing you both end up just being bludgeoning each other right it's and it's again still not a really good representation of the art right like Know, I can't imagine that Grandmaster Flora Villabrell in a Hogo Toto matches where they're wearing no safety gear and they're just, it's MMA with a stick that they were fighting like that. It's just, that is, that is, I can't accept that as a possibility. Maybe it was, but I just can't accept it. But, um, but what I realized being in the center while they're swinging all their sticks and I, I don't think I even had a helmet. The center judge, as a center judge, I don't think I had a helmet. It didn't matter though, right? Um, I'm watching them, and I, what I noticed is that there's 
timing, that there's a space and time inside that match <clears throat> as they fight and they attempt to check and trap each other as they're striking and whatnot, uh, that you can't achieve an experience without that gear. So as part of a continuum, I think it's a great way to train. If it's the only thing or if it's the end of your training, I find it an evolutionary dead end, right? Um, master, um, I'm losing his name right now. <clears throat> he uh, He's called Stickman, Jeff Finder. And uh, Master Jeff Finder, he, he, I've worked with him on a number of events interacted with him in the last 10 or more years. And uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I stand on his achievements, right? In that he took Serada Escrima, my seed art, my, my core art that I learned from my father who learned from Monong Angel. Jeff, Jeff Finder learned from Monong Angel as well as a, a guru, <clears throat> but he took it and uh, went to the Philippines, fought in the week half, and won and got a championship, right? It's acts like these people that go where he probably had no friend and he made friends and he competed and he achieved the highest accolade you can. He got gr world championship, grand champion, or you know, champion for his division, whatever it was, right? <clears throat> Which is a feather in everybody's cap at the Serada and his student, Nick Merchant, just recently did that again in the Philippines, went out there representing himself, of course, but also representing Serada, as we want, and showed how it's efficacious still. And uh, he, <clears throat> now he's, he's pursuing, Nick's pursuing, doing the same thing uh, with the Dog Brothers, right? I've had already had a student uh, go out and become a Dog Brother credits the Anayan system of agreement to his ability to do that too so you know but it's a good it's a good exercise for people to do as they go through is to, to do those things right so um, you know I, I commend uh, Nick for his efforts and and honestly I, I did like every ever other FMA practitioner especially if you're coming from Serata, its notoriety, it, the knowledge of it is, is certainly for, you know, you know, your your luminaries like, you know, our progenitor, Grandmaster Angel Cabals, but luminaries like, you know, Ron Saturno, uh, uh, Darren Tabone, uh, Sultan Udin, uh, Jaime Caballero, my uncle Jimmy Tacosa, my dad, Mike Inai, Uncle Danny Inosanto, uh, Richard Bastillo, my uncle Remy Estrella, Eric Herbert, all these different people that through the years contributed, participated, went to events, did demonstrations, competed in fights, went out and taught and did seminars. Uh, you know, whether it was 1960 or 1996 uh, or 2016 there's people that did that and, and depending on where you start you, you 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 are part of that community and you benefit and also you 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 enjoy the um the detriment of those who contribute if they represent for ill or for or for good right so you know i have to always acknowledge my seniors and it's 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 wonderful to be able to have uh uh an association with people like Master Jeff Finder and to hear his his input. And it's it's unfortunate. He he feels like as a uh, as someone who's you know helped you know teach and 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 bring out notoriety and, and produce and spread the art that his teacher gave to him and that he loves so much. You know, he literally told me he feels like he's an evolutionary dead end. I don't believe that, Master Finder. Not at all. Uh, because it, it was people like you, yourself included, right, that kept the art alive and contributed to the art, right? Uh, and, you know, 
I don't always agree with everything that everybody does. Like, but you know, there's all these people that contributed. Mark Wiley has written a lot of books. Darren Tabone continues to do his legacy. Grandmaster Darren Tabone continues to do his legacy events that I've participated in to bring, uh, you know, awareness to the Stockton legacy, Stockton FMA, right? Uh, Ron Saturno continues to do his videos and trainings and is, is taking under his wing exclusively certain select students to show them his art. And he shares that with that. My Uncle John... You know, Peterson, Master John Peterson, who was a student of my father's, was greatly enamored with the way that uh, Grandmaster Ter Darren Tabone taught the art and felt it was a, a, a re reputable uh, rendering of the art in its own way. And, and it's still just part of a continuum. Nick's doing an interesting thing as he tries to uh, understand Serada in its totality as he wants to be able to to understand the art from all the different people that are out there that are still teaching to get an understanding of it. And I did the very same, similar thing with reaching out to, you know, um, after my father passed, reaching out to um, my uncle uh, Jimmy and, uh, of course, my uncle John and uncle Frank, who are still teaching within the system, but my uncle Remy Estrella, who, who doesn't teach very publicly, and I only see during family reunions right now. And then, of course, Michael Perry Craver, who's teaching on the down low. Continuing to look at them, whether it's through di direct contact or through whether they leave in videos and articles that they might have written or, you know, things that they might have said to come to a deeper understanding. And the same thing as, as I, I continue to look at uh, the, my seniors and the people that came before me, like, Monumenta Revelar, whose uh, largest faction of students are the Stockton Multi Style folks from SLD. So, you know, and I'm executing the same thing that we do with regards to the system here now, where you're learning the different drills as part of a continuum. And that, you know, we're decomposing little pieces so that we can understand them and then we reintegrate them in a way where our understanding is stable and that we can render the art in a way that's uh, useful for ourselves, but also communicated and transmitted to the next generation. So ultimately, you know, the curriculum is for two things. It's to develop individuals that are capable. And when we say capable, and I'm really only referring to the United Systems Agreement because I really can't speak for any other uh, uh, program other than the Spider Gearbox system, which is my own uh, brainchild, right? Uh, is the, the curriculum is designed to develop capable individuals and then also to preserve itself so that those capable individuals, should they choose, as part of a continuum, <laughs> pass that on to the next generation. Other than that, it's 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 not uh, anything else, right? Like, I think it's it's not entirely correct to say that you know I founded you know ABC fighting systems, and uh, it's it's a fighting system. Mm. <sighs> Structuring chaos. Fight is chaotic. It's chaos. It's it, a real fight is not is not. Um, it's not on a plane. There's no weight class. There's no referee. There's there's none of that. At the same time, that's a great way to test your abilities is through that that you know more contrived sports kind of thing, right? Uh, a fight is uncertain, and and while most of the time, as you become more well versed, you don't fight people of of any particular caliber that you would you know feel concerned about, but the violence of action of your opponent can can be all that they need, right? It's that whole saying, you know, everybody has a plan until they get hit in the face. That's Mike Tyson, right? But, um, uh, you know, at least for the United System of Eskrima and the Spider Dumont system, they are not fighting systems. They are a curriculum and structure that allows for individuals to explore in a structured way and understand the chaos that a fight is and to, the, and to therefore become well-versed 
in such a way as that they can thrive inside that chaos and they can express themselves as it is an art. And then from there, move on to um, being able to, as if, if they absorb the full curriculum, to become instructors themselves and you know, be stewards of that monolith structure and begin the process of decomposing the little pieces that are necessary for students to understand and absorb and be able to execute themselves so that they then also may in turn as part of a continuum become capable individuals themselves and produce other capable individuals right um <clears throat> dai shihan sikku uh, when he was passing away as you know one of the main people for the kilohana martial arts association uh you know, that, that was really his organization. I'm now the president of it currently, right? He said to one of his students, a good friend of mine, you know, uh, you know, he, he had become an instructor on his own right, but really wasn't teaching. And he looked at him on his deathbed and he goes, how come you're not teaching? You should be teaching. He's like, oh, I don't want to teach and stuff like that. And he looked at him and he goes, the art, the, it's not, it wasn't meant for you. Meaning, it wasn't meant only for you. What Monong Angel taught to my father and how my father um, helped structure that, and the structure that we see coming out of West Coast society, if it's influenced in, in any way by Serata, as most people know it, that's actually the architecture of Mikey and I, my father, who essentially is the architect of Eskrima, if if Monong Angel is the father of Eskrima and in the United States and it's influenced in any way, any other system or art, that structure is the brainchild of the Anai family. But it wasn't for him, my father. Neither was what Max taught him or what Leo taught him. And it's not for me either. And it's not for you either. It's all part of a continuum. We'll see you on the training floor. Hopefully I'll see you at the memorial. If not, join the online training, like, subscribe, do all those things. Either way, see you on the training floor.